Good morning, this is Steve Johnston and this is our fourth day through the book of Exodus, 10 days through the book of Exodus together. Today we read the remarkable story, famous around the world, of the Red Sea crossing. My observations actually come from the verses before that in chapter 13, but if you haven't done so already, again, please do subscribe to the YouTube channel. If you're on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, jump over to my YouTube channel and subscribe. And then if you wouldn't mind just liking the video, and then I'd love to read your comments on the verses that we're reading together as well. So chapter 13 from verse 11 to um, 14 or 15 is what I'm going to read to you and make a comment on this morning. So this is the account of a certain ritual that the Lord Yahweh, the God of, of the covenant promises now, the God of the Hebrews, he gives them certain rituals that they must keep for all their days in order to remember what happened on the night of the Passover. Uh, God had just struck the firstborn of all of Egypt, both animals and humans. And so as they have now crossed, um, well, they haven't crossed the Red Sea yet, but they've, they've gone out of Egypt. They're now on the edge of the Red Sea. God speaks to, to Moses immediately and he says, in the future, I want you to consecrate to me every firstborn, whether it's an animal or a human being, the firstborn are mine because I struck all the firstborn of Egypt in order to rescue you from your slavery. So let's read these verses. And he says, and it shall be when Yahweh brings you into the land of the Canaanites, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, that you shall set apart to the Lord all that open the womb. That is every firstborn that comes from an animal which you have, the males shall be the Lord's. But every firstborn of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. If, if you don't redeem it, then break its neck. And all the firstborn of man among your sons you shall redeem. So instead of killing them like they had to kill that donkey, uh, a man is of more worth than a donkey. And so uh, he says, I want you to redeem them. They would have to pay a certain sum of money. Uh, to, and and in, in the future, they would bring that money to the temple during Israel's worship. When they had a, a child, they would come to the temple and pay the redemption money. So why this, this ritual that there's, there's, there's the death of certain animals, like unclean animals, like a donkey, human beings get redeemed with money. And this is to continue through the life of Israel. What's all this about? Well, he explains, so it shall be when your son asks you in time to come saying, what is this that you shall say to him by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go, that the Lord killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore, for that reason, my son, I sacrifice to the Lord all males that open the womb, but all the firstborn of my sons I redeem. Okay, so here's my note. <clears throat> when, as a Christian, you are asked, particularly by your children, when they question things, when they don't want to comply with certain of the Christian rituals that we have. When asked about the rituals of our faith, like, why do we have to go to church? Like, wh why do we celebrate communion? What's this bread and wine about? Why are people baptized? Uh, why... Do we say grace at meals? Why do we give thanks? I'm constantly having to stop my children from starting to eat when we sit down. I mean, it just seems like, well, what's wrong with these people? Uh, every night, I'm, I'm like, guys, we say grace in this home. And then they all sheepishly put down their knife and fork. Now, I learned something for this. I'm going to do this with, with my kids. When questioned or challenged about the rituals of our faith as Christians, we must each be able to say more than just because that's what Christians do. That's what we do. That's what we've always done. That's what we do here. No, we must each be able to point 
back to when God delivered us from a life of bondage to sin. Ritual is only valuable when we embrace what it represents. And so what God has put together, let no man separate. We do not experience and involve ourselves in ritual for the sake of ritual. And of course, the danger is to do that because ritual is very powerful to bind people together. Ritual, even without a living experience of what the ritual represents, can still be powerful. Just look at the Jewish nation. Just look at the Muslims. It is ritual that binds those people together. If you've ever been to a bar mitzvah, you will see Jewish people come together over the most elaborate rituals and the singing and the swaying and the chanting and the stand up and the sit down and the and and yet for for now I don't mean to be contentious but there's no life in it they don't know the Lord he who does not have the son does not have the father the Bible says there's no spirit in it there's no life in it and yet is there a nation that is as close closely knit as the Jewish nation today. Why? Because the rituals themselves have bound that nation together. It has preserved the sense of unity as a people. But it is a perversion of ritual, is the point I'm making. Ritual must never be separated from what it represents. And so when your children say, why do we do this? Why do we do that? You, you tell them, because my children... When I was 23 years old, on the 28th of June, 1998, I walked into a church as a broken, sinful, bound person in bondage to all of my, all of my particular sins. And I had no hope, no future, no vision, and my life would have been a complete mess if I'd continued on the road I was. And that night, I heard the preaching of the gospel, and I encountered Jesus Christ, and he called me to himself. I committed my life to him. Shortly after that, I was baptized in the Holy Spirit. I have had an encounter with God, and I can tell you this, my children. He's alive. He has changed me. He has forgiven me, and he set me free from the bondage I, I was in to sin. That is why we say grace at this table, because we wouldn't have this house. We wouldn't have this family. We wouldn't be enjoying this meal together if it were not for how he delivered me those many years ago. We must not separate the ritual from what it represents. That's my encouragement to you today. I did have one other thing that I noticed uh, towards the end of those verses um, where um, it, it talks about how the Lord fed the children of Israel for 40 years with manna in the desert. And I just wanted to encourage you with this. If particularly at these uncertain economic times, you are particularly struggling financially and yet you are a believer. I just want to encourage you. The, the children of Israel were in the, the desert and yet God knew what they needed. He tested them with lack to see how they would respond. Did they have faith? But he knows what you have need of. And he is well able and willing to supply your needs. So ask him. Ask him in faith. Don't ask him with anger and, and, and suspicion like the children of Israel did. But come to your father and ask him to supply your needs. And I'm actually going to close today's video with a prayer for those of you that are in that situation. So Father, I want to commit each of my brothers and sisters to you who are struggling particularly financially at this time. God, you know the uncertainty that we face and the troubles that many small business owners face and many employees face. And so, God, I pray for them, Lord. You know what your children have need of. God, you do make a difference between your people and those who are not. And I pray for your people this morning, God, that you would supply their needs. Lord, you know what they need, and I'm asking you to please supply their needs. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. Subscribe to the channel. And then I will see you tomorrow for our next devotion.